after coming back after seven years, I see more familiar faces throughout the group mm-hmm. than I ever thought I would. Everyone's still here. Yeah. Tons of people are in the same place or have grown. Welcome, everyone, to the Driving Vision Podcast brought to you by the Ziegler Auto Group. And here with me, Auto Group Director of Talent Development, Mike Van Ryan. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks, Sam. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast, like it if you do, and leave a comment. Today, I go in studio with a member of Team Ziegler, Ryan Post. Learn about Ryan's background, what brought him into this automotive business, and the skill sets he hopes to utilize in his new role. Join me now in studio for this special interview. It's kind of cool because today we're sitting here in studio high atop Ziegler Kalamazoo Honda Stadium Drive in studio with uh, one of the newest but oldest team members across the Zag, Ryan Post. Ryan, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. So it's exciting to have you here. I say you're new because you rejoined the auto group just a month or so ago. It's been a whirlwind, but you were here before. When did you start with the Ziegler Auto Group? Yeah, I started in, I think it was 2007. I was with the group. I came aboard when we only had five stores. Wow. So it's come a long ways. It has come a long ways. What, uh, so what initially brought you to the auto group way back then? What, what was your role in yeah. those early days? Yeah, so uh, I, I was working with a group in South Bend, Indiana, and uh, I got a call from Mike Van Ryan one day, and he reached out to me and uh, was a finance director at the time, and I came back up to the group and uh, up in Granville and became the GSM and was the GSM up at the, that location for almost 10 years. That's cool. Yeah, very good. So you know the Granville market, you know that Holland area where, you know, we continue to grow, we continue to have a great presence. And you're in Western Michigan, which is kind of the birthplace of the Ziegler Auto Group. So it's interesting. You're going along with life and uh, you're a general manager of a large group in Western Michigan here. And you become aware of a position that's available, not available a lot. Yeah. And actually, there's a misnomer out there. A lot of people think, hey, you know what? Uh, Matt Thomas left the group. You came aboard. You're not really replacing him, right? You're doing some different things, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I came into a great opportunity about six, seven months ago and uh, as a general manager of a big import store. And Aaron and I, over the last seven years, when I was overseeing a, a few stores at another group, have stayed in touch and along with Mike Van Ryan and he reached out to me and we connected and uh, couldn't be happier to come back in a very different role. Like it's yeah. not the in-store role as, yeah. uh, as it w- has been for the last 20 years for me, but uh, it's been fun. I'm learning a lot and uh, it's, been, it's been a great opportunity to c- help lead a lot of stores and help out where I can. Yeah. So it's interesting. We're all in this automotive industry. Part of what we do on this show and on the podcast is it's fascinating to find out a little bit about people's history, what brought them to automotive, why are they yeah. here? So where did you start in automotive? What was your first auto uh, job? Yeah. So two days after I graduated college, it'll be 20 years on May 5th. I've been mm-hmm. in the automotive business. Um, I was uh, hired through Ethos Group, which is similar to our Brown and Brown. Mm-hmm. And they brought you in right into the store right as a finance manager. Okay. So so did you work for Ethos or you worked for the dealership? I worked right? for Ethos. I was placed in a dealership. And after my first 90 days, I was hired in through the dealership. Okay. So. They hire you as an employee of Ethos. Yes. So it'd be like being hired as an employee of... So did you know the owner of Ethos out there? I did not know the owner. Okay. I had a recruiter that placed me in that store and part of their... Uh, out of college placement, they put you a hundred miles away from wherever your hometown is so that interesting you can yeah. uh, work all the hours and get really ingrained in the automotive business. As you came out of college, what attracted you to that? That's kind of a leap, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to go work for a finance company. I was going to teach high school. I had an economics mm. degree or maybe coach football was my goal. And one of my buddies who I bumped into was a finance manager through Ethos Group. And uh, he was telling me how great it was and how it's a big sports and team atmosphere and how I would... Uh, Which is he- true, by the way, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. The automotive is team and, and ethos. I actually know that company fairly well. Yeah. We looked at them within Ziegler for a while uh, and ended up going with Brown and Brown. But that's, yeah. Yeah. It's team. Yeah. And he saw his success and he kept on telling me I was coming out of being a little bit of a college athlete for a few years. He's like, this is the closest business that you can be in that environment where there's constant competition yeah. and growth and... He thought I'd be great at it, so I connected with a with an Ethos rep and did a bunch of different tests and whatnot, and found myself in South Bend as a finance manager. Hmm. Did you like it? I loved it. It was yeah. uh, I didn't know any better. I went from being a college athlete to all of a sudden working six days a week, twelve hour That's days. A transition, especially like nights, weekends. You don't have any yeah. free time. Yeah, I think the best thing they did is placed you out of the area where you're from. 
They got so, you out of home. Right? They got you out of home, so you were able to work all the hours and really ingrain yourself. And I was too stubborn to back off on that. I wanted to be successful. So because uh, you're a competitive athlete, right? Exactly. What sports did you play? I played baseball in college. Okay. Yeah, I played cool. baseball in college for a couple of years. I had a chance to play football at, uh, and uh, chose baseball. But uh, yeah, so it was great getting in that team atmosphere once again. Yeah. What do you remember as being the toughest? thing to learn as a new finance manager like all those years ago what was the what was the biggest challenge then you know the biggest challenge i think was uh back then and we were still faxing over deals and fundings and whatnot it was much more relational yeah which was interesting and being a 21 year old kid in that type of role i think the toughest thing was just being able to lead people that were twice your age yeah and being able to be in charge of different areas that uh you know, you've never had that responsibility over before. Yeah. So the people atmosphere, the environment of being a young person in a leadership position was probably the toughest at first. How did you see finances leadership? Talk to me about that. It's just everything that the salespeople come in and need. You know, our job yeah. is to, you know, be the lowest point of the funnel to try to keep everything organized and timely and help the salespeople complete their sale. Yeah. So we were at a high volume store. It was a 300 car store. So we we're constantly busy and salespeople were ready to take care of a customer and move on. Yeah. So my job was to help them do that as fast as possible. So they continue their day and keep serving our customers. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, what was the biggest frustration as a new finance manager? Cause again, I think back like you got to have some empathy, right? Like oh, yeah. most people. So I started in automotive as a, as a lot guy, like I washed cars, swept the lots and you kind of work your way all the way up. Right. You're a, you're a college graduate walking into a car dealership yeah. telling people, Hey, I skipped the sales floor. I'm going to go straight into finance. And yeah. by the way, I don't work for you guys. I work for a finance company, right? Yeah, it, it was tough. What, what our group did, what I thought they did well is uh, they, they also wanted you to get the, the sales experience. So I remember my day off was Wednesdays, but you didn't get a day off unless you sold a car. Yeah. So I had to come in and try to learn how to sell a car. So you, I was always excited to possibly have a day off. So I came in and I waited as soon as I waited at the entryway of the parking lot where customers would come in so I could sell a car. But That's it, cool. it, it why'd you do that? Because I wanted to try to get a ch- chance to go home and yeah. do laundry and, you know, have some time to myself because we we're yeah. we we're opening and closing the store. So, I mean, in my first year, I still remember I sold 67 cars in 52 mm. days that I was selling cars. Mm. And, and it was a good opportunity to prove yourself and learn the rest of the business because you were kind of going into a management level. right You're out skipping of, a roll, skipping yeah. a spot. So I took advantage of trying to learn that and I really embodied that and tried hard to be a part so, of the team. So you keep saying finance is manager. So it's interesting. A lot of finance managers across our auto group, and I actually subscribe to this too. Like it's one of the toughest jobs because you're not a manager, right? Like yeah. you're not signing paychecks. You're not hiring and firing. Now it is a leadership position. Uh-huh. And we talk about this a lot. Like a good finance manager has to be an extraordinary leader because they're responsible to work with salespeople and the desk and service to achieve and accomplish our mission. Uh-huh but they can't necessarily fire anybody, right? How did you yeah. navigate that? Or, 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 or was it the setup different where you were, where it was more of a, you, you, you've said manager a couple times, where yep. it was more of a management role. You know, I, I, I felt that it was always as managing the processes, managing yeah. the paperwork, managing the banks. I yeah. never thought I was managing people. Okay. Like I thought we were more of a resource for our sales staff. That's awesome. So I always, I always felt like I was, I was helping them do a job and it was an opportunity for me to make income for them. Like yeah. we don't go out and grab the customers, you know, yeah. we're in a spot where salespeople are bringing us opportunity to take care of their customer. Yeah. So I never thought it was managing people. Like mm-hmm. it was an opportunity to grow some people and learn from people, but I always thought it as an opportunity to just encapsulate the deal yeah. and manage all the processes in the meantime. That's interesting. Yeah. So uh, you worked for Ethos for a while, yep. then you became an employee of that auto group. And where, where, where did you end up? Yeah. Next? Yeah, I did. I was, so I was finance manager of the group for one of, one of the finance managers of the group for about a year. And then I had an opportunity to be promoted and I was the finance director over all three stores. Mm. So I did that for about two and a half years. And then a few months before I had a voicemail from Mike Van Ryan, I became the GSM of a, a Toyota store that we opened a brand new point at down there. Mm-hmm. So um, that led me to Granville and the general sales manager role. And uh, like I said, on to almost 10 years with the Ziegler group from there. Yeah. And then you had a time away from Ziegler and then you've come back. Yeah. What, what, in your mind, what separates Ziegler most from other auto groups out there? There's ton of car dealerships, yeah. right? Yeah. The biggest thing was stuff that we're doing right now. Like even when I was gone, I mean, I, I was lucky to have someone like Aaron and Mike Van Ryan were always connecting with me and mm-hmm. we're, we'd have 
conversations and meetings a couple times a year. Yeah. I think we all knew that it was a matter of time before I came back, but I wanted to come back for things like this. Like I followed podcasts while I was mm. out whenever yeah. there was a Aaron Ziegler announcement or a Ziegler auto group announcement. Yeah. Like I was sneaking away to an office to keep an eye on what was going nice. on. It was just the communication and just the growth. I mean, like I said, I mean, when I got with the group, we had five stores and now we're 40 plus. Yeah, 41. It's, you amazing. know, and everybody, even outside the industry, and I worked for a fantastic group, but everyone kind of sees the Zigglers as kind of like the Yankees. You yeah. know, you want to be on that top team if there's an opportunity and seeing everything that was being done here while I was gone just made me want to come back even more. Yeah. So you live in, you live in near Granville. Yep. Uh, Coopersville. Coopersville. Married kids? Married kids. Yep. My wife, uh, Samantha, and I have been married almost 11 years. That's She's awesome. a human resource uh, payroll director for a company outside of Grand Rapids. Which is cool because you guys can do lunch together as you office yes. a lot of the time in Granville or Yes. In that area. She's 10 minutes from me, not even, so we can That's grab cool. some lunch here and there. My daughters are super active. Fiona's 11. She's, uh, she's in fifth grade, and my youngest is Libby. She's in second grade, and she's eight years old, and they're heavily involved in everything. We're busy yeah. every night, basketball, volleyball, gymnastics. It's a lot of fun. That is awesome. Uh, do you see, so do you coach? Do you, are you involved in that with? Yeah, my wife coached quite a bit. I haven't been able to as much. We, we mm-hmm. assist when we can and we help out, but, uh, we're at as many events as we can right now. Yeah, that's cool. What do you enjoy doing most with your kids when you have that time? Sure. So one of the things that separates Ziggler auto group from everybody else out there, we talk glass door ranking, highest yeah. rank auto dealer, uh, overall company, and then a highest ranked uh, work-life balance among auto dealers, which is crazy. So we were able to actually still connect with our family and have a outside life and yet still crush it in retail. Yeah, absolutely. Like I, I'm, I'm a pretty simple person. Like I, I like working hard and I like being a part of my family. I don't do much else. So mm-hmm. the group itself allows you to have that balance, which is wonderful, yeah. which is probably after coming back after seven years, I see more familiar faces throughout the group mm. than I ever thought I would. Everyone's still here. Yeah. Tons of people are in the same place or have grown. And you know, that that's probably why our turnover is how it is. I mean, the group is an awesome opportunity to have that balance where you can be a big part of your family yeah. and work hard for the automotive group and, you know, uh, have an opportunity for a great future. Yeah. So home family, that's important to you. Um, what, what's an activity you enjoy doing with your kids? You know, we, we do about everything. We like going fishing. We travel. We, we, uh, we make sure we get to the Upper Peninsula every year to do a lot of outdoor stuff. And every Very spring cool. break, which is a few weeks away, we always head down to the Indian Rocks Clearwater area for a week and okay. spend a lot of time there. Go to Florida, spend it on the beach. Right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. What do your kids enjoy doing on the beach? Oh, the crab hunting, yeah. being in the water. There's a little water park we go to. And then uh, my, my oldest is huge into sea turtles and dolphins so we hit the aquarium up there in clear water every year but anything That's like awesome. that we, that we can do we do together yeah so coming back and being part of the auto group again you're involved in our corporate team and you're working with some of the vendors you're involved in some of the special events and whatnot where do you see some of your biggest strengths you know i've i've been around you and watched you interact with some of the stores and specific topics what what uh, what are some of your biggest strengths you think as you bring uh, as you come back to the auto group? Yeah, I'm I'm a strong believer in just organization and processes. Like everyone's heard it. I, I'm I, I'm a big into the four P's like process, people, promotion, and product. Like those areas, I think that if we can thrive in and do a really good job, everything else is going to come into place. Yep. So uh, used cars has been a big one of mine over the last seven eight years. I've I've enthralled myself into that and. A lot of it seems very complicated, but I feel like you can run solid used car departments by just having amazing processes in place. Yeah. And I think that's where it starts, especially in the post-COVID era. I think you see stores that are breaking records every month, and then you see places like uh, Vroom and used car dealerships yeah, that are going down. under. Yeah. And I believe it's it's simple when it comes to that. It's just a, a solid process in place. And if you have good processes, you're going to be able to be successful with good people. But if you have great processes, you know, there, there's no ceiling when it comes to great processes and having great people. So, so, so you started uh, out of college in kind of the finance world. At what point did you get into used cars? Used cars I got into probably about 15 years ago. Yeah. But um, once I left the group, so I, I was at the Granville store where mm-hmm. when we were there, we were selling 100, 125 new cars and 70 or 80 used cars. Mm-hmm. So our new car sales would create all of our used car inventory. Yeah. And the group I went to was a much lower new car sales, which means you had to figure out how to acquire used car inventory. And yeah. if you didn't have a good used car department, 
you weren't going to be successful. So yeah. I dove into that, you know, elbows deep and really educated myself and figured out different ways and a lot of trial and error yeah. until our used car departments were, you know, firing on all cylinders. And the fortunate thing for us is we were at that point before COVID. Mm-hmm. So post COVID, we we're still set up for a lot of success. Yeah. And I think a lot of those areas I'm going to be able to bring back to the group and help wherever I can help. Yeah. What are, uh, what are some of the biggest tips? What are some of the biggest things that you see? Well, actually, let's start here, yeah. though. It, uh, used cars have been crazy the past few years, mm-hmm. right? Nobody ever would have predicted coming into COVID that in the first days of COVID, everybody tried to flush their inventory. That created some excess, brought a little downward pressure on pricing, not mm-hmm. huge, not as much as anyone ever anticipated. And then as we climb back out, used car prices appreciated like they never have, which is odd because past few weeks we've started to see that a little bit of that. That's not going to sustain itself. But through COVID, uh, used car prices appreciated. People were able to amass huge collections of used inventory and make money on that and were able to hold it for a long time and make money. What do you see as some of the biggest pain points in today's environment where we're kind of back to some sort of a maybe it's some sort of a new norm, whatever that means? Yeah. Yeah, I I think the biggest thing is we got away from being good at our jobs in a lot of ways. Like the COVID times and the post-COVID times when there was a lot of success in the car business, it it created some laziness among among some groups and some teams. And I think you need to stay sharp during those times. And the biggest thing now that I think a lot of us forget is getting back to the basics. Like you, you need to make sure that your merchandising is correct. You need to make sure that your pricing is correct, that you're being smart with acquisitions. And that you're babysitting that every day. Like yeah. I always had a, I always had a, a mantra that I lived by. It was being bulletproof by noon. And what that mm. meant was all the little things: pricing, merchandising, acquisitions, organization with photos, notes. All the little stuff needs to be done at a high, high level. And the rest of the stuff's going to fall into place slowly. Because mm. at that point, once you're past being organized and having all that set up and ready to go, that's when you work on your training with people. That's when you work on your growth and how you're pouring into your young and up and coming people. But it, it's really the little things that people have just gotten away from. And you can kind of see that when you look at different websites and different auto groups where, you know, if things are getting a little sloppy, you, you probably realize that the little things are getting out of whack. The big things are probably coming behind it as well. Yeah. So getting back to basics on the little things, what do you think the biggest opportunities are in the coming years? You know, there's a lot of factors that have never Mm -hmm. existed. So technology is involved in a way it's never been before. Uh, You know, used car pricing and volatility, a little bit of a challenge. Some of the new car inventory uh, returning, special incentives on that and rebates driving uh, new car pricing down and putting pressure on used. Um, What what are some of the biggest opportunities in, in used cars? Yeah, in used cars, I think one of the biggest opportunities is it, it, is your turn time. If if you're going to be able to be successful with your turn time, we're we're going to start seeing more trades coming in with the new cars. The factories are going to have to incentivize their product. They're going to have to push these new cars. So I think we're actually going to be seeing more trade-ins, but mm-hmm. there's going to be a lot less cars coming off lease as well. Yeah. So I think the biggest area of opportunity is every dealership, everybody is going to have to be all hands on deck to acquire private party purchases any mm-hmm. chance that they can yeah. and try to find a way to gather your used car inventory in other non-traditional ways, not just auction. Yeah. So I think that, and it's hard to do. I mean, any can get, anybody can get in an auction and just buy cars, but yeah. the most successful stores I think are going to be being really unique in how they acquire their vehicles. Yeah. And that's going to take all hands on deck. It's not just the used car manager. It's not just the used car team. It's it's everybody. Uh, we had we had a situation where we had a we had a title clerk at one of my dealerships that I was overseeing, and every weekend she would send five ten pictures of cars on the side of the road to our used car manager, and she mm. ended up making more money mm. sending these cars to our used car manager who ended up buying them. That's great for idea. a couple hundred yeah. dollars a car every week. She was making more money through buying cars than she was being a full-time title clerk for yeah. us. Wow. And the only reason I think we were able to do that is the message was clear throughout the whole store and what our biggest target was. We needed to find used cars. Yeah. And I think if people take different angles and are a little bit unique in how they're finding them, we're going to have a chance to, to grow, in a, grow in a big way quick. Yeah, that's cool. What, uh, what other areas of opportunity in the auto space? You know, it's such an... This industry is so unique because, you know, you've been in it long enough. You've probably seen it. People, I mean, the, the opportunity is limitless, right? Yeah. Like people just, all, all they need to do is bring a desire to work and, and a little bit of competition and then just a lot of hustle and anything can happen in this industry. Um, you know, what, 
What, what other opportunities are on the horizon, in your opinion? I think another big one is our, our F&I teams. Um, all the stats and all the information out there are saying that people are keeping their cars longer. Yep. And if they're keeping them longer, they're going to have to fix them longer. Yeah. And, and when you paint that picture, our F&I team sells a bunch of products that are taking care of our customers. And it's very important for someone that's going to have a longer lifetime of the vehicle. Yeah. I think that's one area. And the other area is just bringing in good people and continuing to keep our people. I mean, we have the best name in the business. Mm-hmm. I mean, we have the Ziegler name. We have, a, we have a huge, huge following in the Midwest, you know, a ton of stores. I think growing our people from within and making our, the future leaders of the company, you know, come up a little quicker, a little faster yeah. is Super only going to help as well. Yeah. And as always, you know, the more technicians we can find and the more people to service our vehicles, and the people we can grow from within, the kid that's changing oil right now that becomes a future technician and really input and pouring into these kids and keeping mm-hmm. them in the company, I think that's a good spot where we can keep our growth going. Yeah, interesting. Uh, do, so everybody does different things to develop themselves and to grow personally. What, what are some things you do to challenge yourself uh, on a regular basis? Do, oh, you, do I, you read? Do you do classes? Do you do yeah. podcasts, webinars? What do you do? I'm a big podcaster. Okay. I, I, follow, I follow a bunch of podcasts I can. And, you know, I, I'm fortunate I have a couple of solid mentors. One of, my, one of my best friends who got me into the business owns a couple of stores on the east side of the state. And mm-hmm. we've been friends for 35 years. And we probably talk two, three hours on the phone about strictly business when during both of our travel times. Mm-hmm. But I mean, and I, I reach out to people that are solid. Like if there's someone at uh, one of our locations that are doing a dynamite job, mm-hmm. like I'm reaching out to them and talking to them, you know, different stores where you see crazy growth and, you know, big wins. I'm reaching out and trying to talk to people. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, that's how you kind of make yourself. You grab all the best things that your your teammates and your your friends do and you make it your own. Yeah. And uh, so I'm constantly trying to learn and trying to grow and staying ahead of the game and being as progressive as I can. Yeah. What's the biggest difference to you? You've had three, four stores. Now all of a sudden you're exposed to 41 stores. What, what are your thoughts about just the size of Ziegler, what it was before versus today? It, it's amazing. And I'm, I'm super proud of it. Like I was mm-hmm. one of the ones that, you know, Granville is the big shiny new toy in yeah. 2006 and 2007. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's funny that uh, like a guy like Charlie Knapp and I are back with the group mm-hmm. after being gone for a while, and we were at that store for so long. Um, the biggest positives is having so many resources to talk to. There's so many stores that are doing great things, and all it does is we can make a phone call to that store yeah. and get valuable information and spread it throughout the group to benefit all of us. Um, that's one of the that's one of the most amazing things, and then there's just the the community side of things. I mean, it's the Ziegler Marathon. It's what we do for the Drive for Life benefit. You know, it's being a part of NASCAR. The corporate branding's gotten so huge, and it's on a national level now. Mm-hmm. It's just it's amazing to see. I mean, I have friends I haven't seen since college that are sending me pictures of our NASCAR on on Sundays, asking mm-hmm. if we have anything to do with it. It's just how how large we've gotten in the right ways is has been amazing to watch. You know, it is interesting. There's some detail stuff that we do that we've done the same ever since we've done it, right? One of the things is we do basically a 20 group for GMs. We'll bring in one role, have them present out best practices once a month. As we've grown, it's essentially stayed the same. But as we grow, it's a great way to share ideas and whatnot. It's very similar to how it was when you were here last time. Every now and again, you hear, hey, you know what? Some of these ideas, they end up kind of being the same. It is interesting, though, some of the best books you read over and over again, you're hearing the same things and you take different things out of it. What's the value in your mind of kind of repeating some of those core basic ideas and processes the same, but getting something new as as you hear and share with each other? I I think it's just being open to learning. I mean, all, all all these meetings that we have, the GM meetings, I mean, you can say they're... I mean, if people say they're redundant, I think it's crazy. There are ideas that end up getting shared there that you've heard before. Yeah. And it's interesting. You know, I I got in the finance world in the late 80s, early 90s, and we've been talking since then, well, parts and service walk, right? Yeah. So how many stores just crush it on a parts and service walk? So you could have somebody stand up in a best practice meeting and talk about how to do a great parts and service walk how to share the number of technicians, the, ex, the amount we spend on training, share our labor rate, tell them where to park. You could do that every single month for three years and you could share it the same way. And it could take two or three months of somebody hearing that over and over again to really have it become their own idea, yeah. right? Yeah, 
No, that's true. I mean, it's part of a part of our pride statement, right? What can we execute? Where's yeah. our execution? Yeah, you know, and a lot of sometimes the, you have to hear it a lot to execute, and, and you have to. And, and some of the stores that I'm looking at and that I've looked at before, it's a lot of it's not the big things. It's not that they don't have a great closer, mm-hmm. or it's not that they don't have a strong finance department. It's that little things like we talked about. It's that the pictures aren't online, mm-hmm. or their website's not converting the right way, or you know, their their pricing is just a little off. So yeah. the, these best idea meetings, I think, are great for people to go to an open mind with and listen and try to figure out areas of things that they know that are already a good idea. So, so why do you think other groups don't do it? If it's such a good idea and it's something that helps us become our best selves, why, why doesn't other people do it? I think this, not everybody does. Yeah, I think the scale of our group helps. Yeah. Because that's one of the first things I incorporated when I left to go to a five star group. Yeah. As we had our monthly meetings. Yeah. And, and there's a little, there's a lot to say when there's five people in the room versus mm. forty one. Yeah. You know, so we'd get a couple good ideas, but we're not getting to the scale of what the what Ziggler has become. Yeah. So there's just not enough to go around. Yeah. And uh, so that's part of it. The growth is has created tons of good information that we can use throughout throughout all the stores yeah all right a couple lightning round questions as we get towards right. the end what's something that most people have no idea about you that would surprise them to know about you all right so i'm a house with three women okay and during covid one of the only things that were on tv were wwe mm, yeah. yeah so yeah. i think uh my daughter's uh, one of my daughter's uh, dream would be to go to a Taylor Swift concert, and the other one would be to go to the Royal Rumble. So oh, we awesome. we, uh, we keep an eye on WWE ever since COVID, which is interesting with three women in the house. Well, and thanks to uh, thanks to Kansas City, uh, you can almost do Taylor Swift and at least football. <laughs> yeah, game, yeah, absolutely. Right? So so you say you're mostly podcasts. What's a book you're reading right now or a podcast you're listening to you're get, getting a lot of value out of? You know, a, a podcast I'm listening to is The Up Bus. It's okay. a new one. I think there's eight or 12 episodes so far. They were out at mm. NADA, and uh, they've come a long ways. And uh, that's been a really valuable one. I think the guy is very progressive and um, a lot of good information. I, w- I would suggest The Up Bus to anybody out there right now. Yeah. You mentioned uh, one of the answers. Uh, who's, a, who's a mentor? Who, who, who's one or two mentors? And, and what do you get out of that? How do you cultivate a mentorship relationship to continue to grow? Yeah, I mean, one of my biggest mentors, one of my best friends, his name's Mike Spiegel. Like, um, he's the one who got me in the business. And mm. he's someone, he's one of those friends. You have, you have friends and you have acquaintances that when you tell them a story, they're like, yeah, 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 that sounds cool. That sounds cool. Mike's always been the guy for me that tells me exactly how it is. Mm. He, he's not a water cooler guy. If I say something and he totally doesn't agree or he thinks I'm crazy for doing something or he thinks it's a bad idea, he'll be open to tell me about that. Yeah. And I think honesty is the best thing to, in growth in a lot of, in a lot of yeah. ways. Like someone really has to be there for you to, you know, give you two sides of it, whether you want to hear it or not. Yeah. And he's always been that guy for me. So he's been a huge, huge influence for me. Hobby. Hobby, biggest hobby. Oh man, I don't know. I, I do about everything that my girls want me to do. Mm-hmm. So, geez, I, I I don't even know where to go with that one. I guess <laughs> following my kids around and doing whatever a bunch of my girls do. I should, yeah. I, should, I should maybe find a hobby. I guess. Yeah. yeah. You know what? It is interesting. I get asked that a lot. Like in this auto industry, this is kind of a hobby, right? Yeah. Like, if you do this thing right, it it uh, it's kind of tough to do a lot of extra things. People flip me crap all the time for. You know, not golfing a lot. We golf yeah. as part of the auto group, and yeah. you know, if your if your golf game is too good, you should probably be a little suspicious about <laughs> what you're doing in your private time, right? Yeah. So yeah, golf used to be a great one. You know, going to I used to love going to minor league hockey games. That was fun, but you know, all that's been turned off, and it's gone from work family, work family on a yeah. on a twenty four hour basis the last ten or eleven years. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, any uh, closing thoughts for our uh, team, both externally, the uh, public out there that listens to the Driving Vision yeah. podcast, but then also to our internal teams? No, I mean, I'm just, I couldn't be more excited to be here. I mean, the Ziggler organization has been, it's been amazing to me and my family and being back into it, even for 60 or 90 days now, it's been wonderful. And I can't believe how far it's come and how progressive it is. And, uh, you know, it's one of those places that you want your family to work at. Like if I had friends yeah. or family and they're, they're a little lost and, and they need a place or an opportunity with a great organization that's going to open some doors. This is just where it's at. This is a, this is a great place to, to uh, try to start a career and keep a career. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We acknowledged our top salespeople on the call Aaron did earlier this week and then on our finance call yesterday. You know, you've got a father and son that are selling cars at dealerships in the same city in Wisconsin. They're both top leaders. 
they actually both got within a few units of last month of selling the same number of units, uh, both almost president's circle, both incredible uh, seeing value in uh, LoJack and ZGuard and some of the other products. It's pretty cool that as family members like that, father, son, that you can compete and, you know, that you can do really well. You know, one thing that comes to my mind, you know, one of the challenges of being part of a, a corporate world and I, I think Aaron and I think we all hate even the corporate, the idea of corporate, right? Because you're looking at all the stores, you're seeing what everybody does. And sometimes you come in, you make suggestions, you try to do things that are going to help people on a larger scale. But it doesn't mean we or you or anybody necessarily knows things better. It's just it's ideas based on experience. Talk, talk to us about your philosophy on that, you know, because yeah. um, we've got people that are incredibly talented, right? That yep. probably don't need a lot of extra eyes on what they're doing, but you know, if I'm a high performer and, and we've all been in that chair, you want someone to kind of say, hey, here's some ideas or, hey, looking outside in, uh, have you thought about this or that? And it's not shouldn't be a threat. It no. should almost be a value thing. Right. Yeah. So. No, I, you know, when I was when I was trying to explain to my wife about this position, when I was when I was coming back, it, it was hard to explain. But in, in a nutshell, I kind of told her, I said, hey, you know, a 25 year old Ryan would have loved this type of person coming in and helping him. The biggest thing for me is I'm excited to come and learn from these top performers and learn from these general managers and sales managers so I can take the best of what they do and spread it around to the young and up and comers or maybe the stores that could that need someone that uh, isn't as experienced. I mean, well, by the way, I'm going to correct you, though, because yeah. the 25 year old would love it. But I'll tell you, I think the older you get and the more experienced you get, the less, you know. Right. And oh, yeah, that's just a truth about human nature and reality. And I think even the most experienced of, of team members who want to get better, mm -hmm. like having someone who's willing to tell you the truth, ask questions, point things out and not, you know, one of the things that separates the Ziegler auto group from everybody else out there, everybody else out there competes to crush each other and to win uh, yeah. each other. And when I compete, I'm going to push you down as I go up at the Ziegler auto group, we compete and rise together. A good leader is never there to push someone down as they go up. A good leader is there to bring everybody up, right? Absolutely. And I mean, I mean, that's my goal. My goal is to one is create some relationships so is, is meet everybody that I don't already know in the group and then find out where they thrive and what they can show me and what I can show them and how we can work together and then help out other stores and help out other departments. I mean, and that's the exciting thing for me. Like I said, I mean, I, I wanted to be a coach. I think a lot of us in this business did. A lot of us are ultra competitive, which I was. Mm. So now it's not like a one Ziggler store versus the other. It's like, I yeah. want our group to dominate everybody else out there in every yeah. way. And the more information we can share together and the more stuff we can talk about as a team and move great philosophies and great processes from one store to the other, the faster we're going to grow and the quicker we're going to be able to do all that together and keep growing together. Yeah. Well, it's crazy. I think when we first sat down here, I was like, hey, this will be 15, 20 minutes. A, <laughs> a half an hour ends up flying by. We'll cut this up a little bit so folks can come in and listen. But we appreciate you being here. Appreciate you uh, being part of the team coming back, being part of Team Ziggler and helping us to grow and to crush it as an auto group across the four state area we're in and beyond. I mean, we're not done growing. We're at 41 rooftops yeah. right now. And I know Aaron and the entire auto group just wants to continue to grow. And the biggest obstacle to growth is an opportunity. The biggest obstacle to growth is having people ready to take on the additional responsibility and, and, and wanting to succeed and win and having those tools. So uh, you get the last word. Last word. No, like, again, I, I probably sounded pretty repetitive. I couldn't be more excited to be with the group. It's, it's awesome seeing where the future goes. And uh, like I said, it's, it's a phenomenal organization and I uh, can't wait to see where Aaron takes it. Awesome. Ryan Post, appreciate you being here. We'll thank see you. everybody out there in Ziggler World. Thanks, everybody. A special thanks to Ryan Post for contributing to this week's podcast. Until next week, how are you driving vision today? Today.